Good day, everyone. Uh, well, this V-shaped bounce continues um, with the uh, major averages up above uh, their respective 50-day moving averages. Um, and uh, we've seen this kind of action before where this market hits a, has a correction and then these averages shoot, just shoot straight on up and uh, eventually uh, hit new highs and then you know in some cases they just keep going higher but of course in kind of a sloppy fashion. Um, now that, that's been true since QE3 started in January of, of last year. Right now we're looking at QE3 ending um, this month so without the QE safety net uh, that could create a problem for the markets uh, psychologically they, they might have a problem with it. And we'll see. We can see that actually after um, QE2 ended, um, the market didn't just come apart. You know, things never happen as they should. The market actually rallied for a couple of weeks. So it, that kind of tricked everyone into thinking, well, QE2 is over, and the Fed doesn't need QE because uh, the economy is actually what they're saying. It actually is better, uh, and therefore we're going to new highs now. Um, and then the big correction came. Uh, if you all remember, in uh, I think it was. Late, late July, uh, August to 2011 with the siege correction. Um, in QE1, when that ended, um, the market quickly sold off, but then found its ground and then went sloppy sideways for about a couple weeks. Hey, uh, Dr. K, you're talking about this, uh, this drop in 2011. That, that was a post-QE drop. Yeah, that's right, post-QE2 drop. And then in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, when QE1 ended in 2010, Oh, that uh, you got, flash uh, yeah, you, you ended up, I mean, you had the signs. The model went to a sell signal uh, days before the flash crash because the, the selling pressure was there and then it had the flash crash. Right. And then went all over the map for the next uh, few months uh, in a very sloppy way. Um, and each time this happened, the Fed eventually stepped in and soothed the markets by, t by saying, okay, we're going to launch a form of QE in the future. So not, you know, don't worry, we'll come in and re we'll come in to the rescue, rescue the markets. Um, I would expect that the Fed you know, doesn't want the market undoing all their hard work, in quotes, um, since 2009. So if uh, this market starts to correct appreciably, say beyond uh, 10%, then expect the Fed to come in even before then to suit the markets and talk about you know, Operation Twist 2 or QE4 or some, something along those lines. Um, but what's nice is that with QE out of the picture, um, there is really not much manipulation or much less manipulation going on so that um, for the volatility, uh, we'll hopefully get a period where we have a nicely volatile market with signals that are fairly coherent. Um, in other words, we're, we're going to see uh, some sort of coherence emerge out of the vol volatility. That's, that's, of course, what we'd like to see um, as happened after 2011's QE2 ended. Um, there was a lot of volatility, but, but quite amount of coherence <laughs> that allowed the model to pick off uh, some excellent buy and sell signals. Um, but we'll see. Um, right now, uh, the question does remain, um, you know, I think going, it's going through everyone's head, you know, is, is, is the Fed true to form in saying that the economy is actually turning a corner here and that, uh, you know, they're going to have to get more uh, hawkish going forward. Um, and that can be interpreted bullishly in certain terms of, okay, yeah, that's a good sign that the QE program has worked. Um, the bears, of course, would say that the QE program hasn't worked and that the economy is still stuck in the mud and um, you know when the Fed uh, says, says things that uh, you know solid job gains and a, and a lower unemployment rate and a range of labor, labor market indicators suggest that um, there's an under utilization of labor resources um, that's diminishing you know that that sounds positive but the problem there is that you know the lower unemployment rate that's highly suspect that's a very manipulated number and the un real unemployment rate is much higher I, the Fed knows that, but they have to um, Fed speak the markets to uh, to justify ending QE3. So they have to say, yeah, we're going to end it. We're ending it, not not extending it because the economy is looking better and better gradually. Um, I, I don't see the signs. Uh, neither does Greenspan, who said very nice, very nicely that uh, the, that uh, you know effective demand is dead in the water um, because the QE program has failed. So uh, I, I, I side more with his viewpoint, um, and I think all this QE that's happened over the last few years, you know, that comes with a fairly steep price. Um, and the question will be, you know, with QE, if I, I believe it'll be a question of when the Fed 
announces QE for, not if they announce it, but when they announce some form of QE going forward, um, the markets are obviously are going to be less believing this time around. But of course, the saying "Don't fight the Fed." They're going to they're going to print money and they're going to pour money into the system. And so, if you pour money into a system, you're going to you're going to cause a price rise. You know, supply basic supply and demand. So, in other words, QE4 will probably see the markets go into another one of these trending, you know, sloppy trending rallies that we've seen um, with QE1 through 3. Uh, so, this, in other words, you know, the model's prepared for that kind of eventuality. Price volume obviously is the final judge, not what the Fed says or does, but um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how, how this sort of action plays out um, and when, when the Fed actually does step up and say, okay, well, we're going to come in, come in and rescue the markets again. I don't expect the Goldilocks scenario of, yeah, the Fed's already achieved a smooth landing, now markets are off to the races, we're going to continue this very old bull market which began in 2009 because the QE program worked. I mean, I, when I'm saying this and I have a smile on my face because it just doesn't sound uh, at all plausible. Um, and you can still see, you know, the, the demand for commodities, um, this downtrend is, is, is very firm. Um, and, so, you know, you've got uh, problems in, in Europe. Europe is looking, to, looking like it's going to have a third recession since 2009. Um, and, yeah, it's, I think that with QE4, I think that'll bail out the U.S. and the markets will probably continue higher to some measure. And that, uh, you know, the European market recessions, the first two didn't really affect the U.S. market. You can see in like a chart of IEV, which uh, tracks uh, a basket of European bourses, um, that's European for markets. Uh, so the IEV has, uh, you know, you can see it's been stagnating since 2009. It hasn't really gone anywhere. And there's what is that, Dr. K? There. What's the symbol? IEV, Indian Echo Victor. Okay. You can see that, uh, yeah, it's at 44, and uh, five years ago it was at 41. <laughs> so, you know, and it, it ha it's had its share of corrections in there, whereas you contrast that to, say, the triple Qs, um, which mirror the NASDAQ 100, and you can see that, that yeah, the, it, the U.S. market gets dragged down a little bit by the European markets, but ultimately um, is able to rebound to new highs um, with the help of uh, these quantitative easing programs. Uh, so, all that's to say is, yeah, European, it, it not, things are not looking good over on this side of the pond. It wouldn't be surprised to see Europe go back into recession. Wouldn't see, be surprised also to see the euro get blown apart at some point within the next few years because it's very unstable and it's a failed experiment. Um, so, uh, it should be, <laughs> of course, should be uh, nothing short of interesting uh, moving forward here um, to see what happens. Um, and as far as the Fed painting itself into a corner, into a QE corner, that that'll also be quite interesting. Um, uh, but you know, the Fed's got a lot of the Fed's actually got a lot of QE ammo. They they can they can print a lot more, um, and inflation is very tame because there's just been a lack of demand. Um, businesses are, are still you know stuck in the mud. Um, but yeah, we could we, unfortunately we could see a QE four, QE five, QE six. Uh, <laughs> ad nauseum. Um, at any rate, uh, with that said, uh, Gil, did you have anything to add? No, I think that pretty much covers it. We can end the webinar now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Now, if somebody asked a question, I mean, uh, to me it's more circle jerk type stuff, but uh, with QE in the rearview mirror now, can we expect the MDM to perform with more accuracy, or should we expect European QE to affect its signals? Frankly, I don't That's know. I, I don't know how you figure out whether something's going to perform with more accuracy. <laughs> right. But, I, I mean, I understand another one what, of those predict the future questions. Right. I mean, it's, I understand where he's coming from in the sense that you know QE has messed up so many tried and true indicators that have worked for decades, and, and those indicators are invalid. And we saw that initially in 2009. Um, and yeah, I mean, with with QE, if QE were not to resurface. Um, we would probably see a partial return, I would, I would imagine, to some, some sort of norm, normality in the sense of, okay, markets can now be, well, they're, le they're simply less manipulated, and with less outside manipulation comes more true market action. Um, and therefore, uh, the model, which has done exemplary during those non-manipulated manipulated times, um, should, 
the, yes, the performance should, in theory, improve, and in theory, the market uh, trend following wizards should all start to do as they've done over the last, say, 25 years of the illustrious careers. Um, that's what I would expect. But of course, everything always lives to surprise. So I don't want to make any hard and fast, uh, you know, conclusions on anything because we are, as Greenspan said, we're in uncharted territory. The Fed is in uncharted territory with this QE business. So just because QE three ends doesn't mean that they're not going to have another trick up their sleeve of some form of uh, market man manipulation. I think they're forced into it. Um, and and with that said, you know, there there are ways around it. Obviously, with now that we've had QE three times, um, it. You know, you learn from the past. You learn that there's ways to deal with it that are more productive than than before. So, you know, if QE4 comes through, it, it will it will, of course, be a manipulated environment. But um, MDM, of course, has ways to deal with that. <clears throat> okay, uh, Dr. K. But wouldn't all this extra supply of money in the system still distort the markets? It all has to go somewhere. Well, if, the, the, if, if they keep pumping money into the system, that's, that's, the, that's the buying pressure that causes the markets to go higher. If you, if you remove that buying pressure, then uh, the markets can be more true to form. Um, now, of course, if, if uh, well, yeah, it's, just, it's that simple. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, I hope that answers your question. Um, it's just a matter of you know manipulation versus no manipulation, and the manipulation is all coming from yeah. money they print that goes into the markets. So you take that element away, you also take the safety net away, and and if history repeats again, you'll see what happened after QE1 and QE2 happen after QE3. In other words, within the next few weeks, if not you know less time, in the next few weeks we'll start to see the market correct and. And if it doesn't correct, if we actually see a strong market, a strong healthy market, that'll be quite a surprise because that means, uh, you know, and if that's also uh, buttressed by um, economic uh, reports that are really showing favorability, you know, and wa actual wage growth and things like that, then, uh, then, then Greenspan's wrong. And the Fed's, uh, all this QE stuff that they've been doing over the last few years actually has worked. <laughs> but that would come as a quite, a, quite a surprise. But again, uh, price volume. Price volume is everything. So in other words, if that did happen, I think it's highly unlikely, but if that did happen, then we're wrong. And, and we, we, take, we take long positions in the market. We'll see pocket pivots, Bible gap ups. Uh, the, the MDM will, you know, will, will sit on his buy signal because it will be in a nice uptrend. That's great. Uh, this person asks, so the eventual withdrawal of the liquidity should then re-distort the markets. I don't, you know, I don't know. You guys are talking Greek. I don't really care. I'm interested in making money. Can I can I get, get on with the uh, stock discussion, Dr. K? All this circle jerking kind of. By all puts, means, yeah. I gotta no, tell you, it puts me to sleep. You know, it's it's totally irrelevant to making such, money. They're getting into such minutia here, and again, I'll, I'll, I've said it many times. It doesn't matter what the Fed says or does. All that matters is price falling action in reaction to 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 events. You know, so if the Fed says or does something that should be considered bullish and the market heads south, that's what, that's all you need to know is that the prices are going lower. So, you know, the MDM operates on that basis, not, not on trying to predict what the Fed will say or do or what they've just said or done. Right. So it's all, it's all just circle jerking. So if that gets you off, we have now concluded our circle jerk session for the webinar and we're going to move on to the actual process of trying to make some money in this market. Uh, for those of you who were on the webinar last week, I gave you this stock right at the 10-day moving average. I think it was right here, right underneath, and uh, told you all to watch for a pocket pivot. You know, I was already buying the stock that day, and boom, we get these beautiful moves. Uh, you get a breakout. You get the pocket pivot here. Now the breakout, which, of course, you has got to pull in. Uh, I sold into this move. It was a 24% move from here to here. A buyback in here. Today we're jacking again. We got over 37 Um I sell into that move today too. So, you know, there's some rumors out there that these guys are going to be bought out by somebody, I don't know who. But, you know, you hear those rumors all the time and I think if you get uh bogged down in that stuff, you stop looking at what the stock is doing, you start uh operating on greed or some other emotion because you're thinking, "Oh, this is going to get bought out at 70 bucks and I'll buy a bunch and It'll get bought out, and I'll be rich, and I can buy an island and a Maserati. But that, that's not going to work that way generally. And so I'm always uh, I look askance at these uh, buyout rumors, and just watch what the stock's doing. And it's my policy to take 
20, 15, 20% profits when I have it. So, you know, bingo, there you go. There's one. So, but I gave this to you guys last week. Here's another one. Uh, we got the pocket pivot here, but it's stalled. But notice it comes right back into the 10-day uh, volumes light. Uh, that's Bible, in my view, and thing comes it's coming back up. Now, now you're coming up in here. The guy, These guys don't announce earnings until uh, November 13th. So there's a lot of time right now. Uh, between now and then, that's a couple of weeks, and so it could push higher. I wouldn't be surprised if it headed up towards 40. But, you know, today's rally is very interesting, uh, in my view, because it's basically being driven by this. V is keeping the, the Dow up as much as this, so you're probably wondering what, why the big divergence between the NASDAQ and the Dow. V uh, is a $233 stock, and the Dow is a price-weighted index, so it has a huge effect on what the Dow is doing today. So what, what I think is happening is they're dragging everything up, uh, the Dow is dragging everything up with it. So you're getting this divergence, and uh, I think your advanced decline is, uh, it's actually 14 to 12 on the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ's up, but you have more decliners than uh, advancers. And you've had stocks like Facebook get creamed uh, you know, on a gap down after earnings, Twitter getting creamed on a gap down after earnings. Uh, it finds some support on the top of this little structure this morning, around 40 bucks, and it's bouncing. But my view is this thing is probably headed lower. And this may be the start of, uh, if you look at this, yeah, to me this is a big pod. And so you saw the two heavy weeks of selling uh, earlier in the month, and now you get the breakdown through the 50-day and the 200-day, uh, or the 40-week, rather. And you're coming in. Look at how they're pushing this thing. <laughs> Gotta love it. Uh, but you yeah, know, you also, you also have Mastercard, which is propping the markets. Going right, up, and course, up big uh, with Visa. Uh, they're not in the Dow, are they? No, actually, I don't believe so. But uh, you know, with the, with the, the this positive action, it sometimes has a um, magnetic effect. Yeah, and so that, that seems to be what's happening because it, trying to make money in terms of individual names, you you definitely have to focus on new merchandise. If you're going after some of the older names, uh, you know, if you bought into Facebook and got sucked into the V V rally here and, and thought maybe this was a pocket pivot you want to buy into, which worked temporarily, and then you held the earnings, you get knocked around. You know, Twitter getting getting smacked. Uh, LinkedIn comes out today after the close, and they're basically continuing to find res resistance around the 20-day. But basically, underneath this area of congestion, you kind of see that, see how that's, it rallies up into there. That seems to be where the resistance is. So when it heads up that way, you can tag it and maybe get some uh, some short-term love. But it seems like you know, there's no nothing really trending here that you want to be building a position. What's your take on that, Dr. K? You see anything you want to be buying uh, for the long haul here? Yeah, the, the only things I, I, I've liked is, uh, you know, the ones you've already talked about, CYBR and RWLK. Yeah, another one. So, um, nothing on my radar yet. I mean, there, there have been some pocket pivots, you know, and things like that. But, um, yeah, I, I'm very... Uh, because you know part of my accounts in the ETF right. from the MDM, you know, I, um, and uh, well, I'm I'm obviously still I'm still working out this other model, which is born from the UVXY, and that that seems to be working pretty well. So I, I want to actually get three months of good results, and then and then release it onto the site. But I, I want to actually you know three months confirmations and you know in real time with real money, and then that'll convince me uh, that uh, you know it can it can be set free. Anyways, uh, here's another name, ServiceNow is breaking out. This stock came public, when was this, last year? No, uh, back in 2012. And it's had, it had one run and setting up in a new base. I don't know if this is kind of late stage and sloppy because on the daily chart you can see it's pretty choppy here. But you had a big volume breakout after earnings and it's held the top of the breakout. So, I don't know, I tend to see this thing bu uh, as being viable uh, on the pullbacks to the top of the base. So, that that's one name that's... Uh, kind of working. You got this tube mogul. I talked about this one last week, uh, buying it off of here. You could see it drying up, and now it launched. So now you're getting the pullback comes right into the 10-day on the top of this cup. So that becomes viable there. Um, and that looks that looks reasonable. Uh, let's see. Somebody says, uh, Cyber and w R W L K great calls. Um, yeah, I mean, these are working, you know. Well, not TWLK, but RWLK. Uh, they're working for now, but this is just barely getting going. We'll see what happens after earnings. I think it's a very compelling uh, situation. The cyber, I, I think, 
is getting extended on uh, buyout rumors. So my inclination is to just dump it in here and take some profits, which I think is, uh, you know, okay. Let's see, any questions here? Uh, tube, we talked about Tube. Somebody says, stock talk, please. I agree. Enough of this blathering about QE and the Fed and all this other BS. It don't make me money. Uh, but I think that the Fed will come on again uh, with QE, like you're saying, Dr. K. I think QE 4 comes in or 5, whatever number it is up to now. Uh, I think they, uh, they come in after we have a market correction. And I wouldn't be surprised if we're getting close to that now, even with this big rally. So I got one eye, you know, I, I'm selling some of these names I have into the strength. And then one eye on the short side here is I'm watching some of these things rally. So I'll give you some examples. Um, Amazon uh, rallying up into this area here. I think the 10-day is probably a good spot where it becomes shortable. You undercut this low here. Uh, this what was in May low uh, from earlier this year, I believe. Yes. And that sets up the rally, undercut and rally. And you're coming up, uh, you're wedging up higher into the 10-day. So I think this becomes shortable up in here. Uh, let's see, LinkedIn comes out with earnings after the close, so you have to decide what you want to do there. I'm, I'm tempted almost seeing what happened to Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I'm wondering if lightning strikes three times uh, in the social networking group and they hit this thing after earnings. Otherwise, you might just be, you know, you could just hang out and see what happens. But if you look at this in terms of the overall setup and forget about the earnings announcement today, uh, it's a big pod. So, you know, it's a it's pretty deep pod. Dr. K, how deep is that? Can you tell me how pan? Let's see. I think I have something here. That will... uh, uh, it went all the way down to 136. 47.2%. Yeah, so, so yeah, definitely about... deep enough for a pod. Okay. So I think that could be a pod in, in the making. We know that Netflix was, you know, but, but notice how uh, this, and this wasn't that deep, I don't think. I think Netflix was only 34 35 percent deep on this thing but it's still you know relative to the overall move it's still a little deeper and looser than other stuff you've seen and you did get some selling in here uh, it's a big reversal at the bottom here but then they kind of let it drift back to the upside and uh, it breaks out and fails so it starts to look like it's, like it's failing here you can see up here where it failed on this gap up breakout uh, you know, that's where it was in IBD and everybody's loving it because it's a base breakout and then it fails uh, it violates the 50-day moving average, but then turns around and goes back to new highs. Okay, and if you think the short side of the market is easy, this, this is a reason why you have to be very flexible and you got to be moving around a lot and taking profits when you have them and not being a pig and understanding where your potential uh, areas of uh, either being stopped out or support would be on an undercut and rally type situation. But anyways, you got Netflix then gaps down. So it's now confirming this big pot. And it's sort of a pot with a sloppy handle. And, and again, this can be seen as a late stage cup with handle where you're going straight across on the handle instead of drifting down. So that's probably not right either. And you're sort of running out of gas on the weekly chart. You can see there's no volume. So that does start to break. And of course, we picked up on that right away uh, in our reports in the MLRs in the morning. And uh, let's see, I'm watching these rallies here. We're not hitting anything yet. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, this thing, a huge gap down 100 points, uh, and they gather, you know, they, they, everybody buys it off the lows. Mark Cuban comes in here and says, uh, you know, it's going to be bought out, you know, just like CyberArk and Pandora and Yelp and all the others that have been bought out that everybody's talked about, uh, you know, talked up buying out, buy out rumors about. Uh, but anyways, you're above the 10-day line, so that becomes your reference point. If it cracks the 10-day line on volume, then maybe you can come after it on the short side using the 10-day as your upside stop. What I would like to see is a rally up to the 200-day moving average on some stupid news, but I, I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, but that's what I would like to see as the most optimal entry point on the short side. So uh, let's see, what else? What else? Now you look at Yelp. You know, We talked about Yelp, I think, last week on the gap down. Shortable gap down, you get a rally up to the 60 level. This sets up a bear flag. And uh, it broke out yesterday through the bear flag. But, uh, you know, what does that do short term? You set up a little undercut and rally. So now you watch the bounce up. This could become shortable in here uh, using either the highs of the range at 60 or if you really want to stretch it out, you get a 62. What is that? Uh, 62.26 on the intraday high on the gap down day. So, so you know, there are there's things setting up that I see that set up on the short side, set up on the long side. I'm, I've been playing both sides. I came in this morning. 
uh, long, you know, CyberArk and uh, RDVLK and even some uh, Mobileye, but I unloaded that at jacked over 40, up a couple of bucks or something, above 52, I think it was, so I sold into that. Uh, but the way I see this market primarily is as a sh uh, short-term day trading slash day trading uh, type market. I don't really see where the big leaders are necessarily that are going to drive this thing higher, and I don't really like the divergence that you're seeing today, which might be a clue that we're coming to uh, a, a juncture where a pullback would be normal. And if you look at the indexes, you can see you're wedging uh, you know, up along the lows. It's, it, it really doesn't want to let go, but you're coming up to the highs here, which is, I think, a perfect spot to see some uh, profit-taking hit. given I mean, this is a very steep uh, ascent, steeper than the descent. And the descent itself was pretty steep, wasn't it, Dr. K? I mean, that was a, that was a pretty nice <laughs> break to the downside. But this is steeper. And, uh, and I, I don't think it can be sustained any more than this sort of break could be sustained by the time you got into a logical area of support down around this congestion area in May. So my guess is you got you're gonna have to pull back and we'll see what happens when you do but I'm interested what's interesting is, is that the, the the rally was was um, was catalyzed by uh, you know one of the, uh, the the fed members um, suggesting that qe3 be extended and uh, you know that that immediately caused a rally and then the market continued has continued higher since then uh, and now that qe3 is ending and there is no sign of qe4 or qe in any form um, it's interesting that the markets still are pushing higher. Um, yet with yesterday, you know, there was a bit of a tug of war going on, but they did close fairly strong, um, and then today they're going higher. So, again, it, it, the market lives to confound, and it all, almost strikes me like this is some kind of manipulation going on to push the to push the market higher, so that uh, some excellent shorting opportunities will get will will be set up. That's what what it seems like to me. So the other thing is you're coming to the end of the month, and I think. Uh, I'm not sure, it's, and somebody who's actually in the business, if you're out there, if anybody's out there who's in the mutual fund business, I think this is a, the hedge fund and mutual funds report around, there's some sort of year end for them. So I don't know, they might, what I'm looking at it here is a rally perhaps that pushes up into year end, and then you can uh, come in on the short side very aggressively and uh, and look for a pullback in November. But, you know, all of that speculation, you got the election on uh Tuesday, and that could also have an effect on the market. So there's a lot of potential news uh, flux out there to push things around. So I mean, the bottom line uh, is, you know, focus on the stocks. And you know, we've given you some good ideas recently and in the last webinar, and uh, especially this like, you know, cyber and, and RWLK. I mean, that thing had like a was a 26 percent move in two days. You know, and if you don't sell into that, I just think you're you know, you're getting a little too greedy, and and they, they give you they're, they're small enough these stocks, especially this one, small enough so that they'll pull back and give you a chance to buy. And the pullback to the 10 day was almost too perfect yesterday. So, anyways, um, but I sell that one in here, so it's up you know above 31, it's up two and a half right now. So, uh, Loco had a pocket pivot on uh, Tuesday. Earnings come out next week, I believe. Is that right, Dr. K? Um, so I, you know, if you want to buy, if you bought on the 10-day line, you know where it gets real tight and it's drying up in here, uh, the volume's drying up, and you're holding tight along this moving average complex. You could have bought it, and if you're up, then maybe you can try and hold through earnings because you got some cushion. But do you want to buy it here in earnings? I don't think so. Um, does anybody have any really good questions on stocks? Somebody's asking about this Hawk, Black Hawk Network Holdings. Uh, this one's acting okay. It's kind of thin, but it, it's, uh, I guess you'd call that a pocket pivot, but what do these guys do? It's just uh, content, uh, fin oh, finance credit card. Oh, they're probably doing well today, thanks to V. That looks okay. I mean, I don't see anything wrong with that. Here's a pocket pivot. It's tucking in a little bit. That might be viable here. Uh, earnings growth is pretty tepid, though, 13% in the most recent quarter, 6% in the last quarter, but they're looking at 26% next quarter. Which I guess you could see as an acceleration, but you know, I'm not gonna get all excited about that myself. Uh, kind of, I don't know. You like this name, Doctor K? You want to give your? Do you want to give your thoughts on this? <clears throat> well, it's had uh, two um, gap ups in the pattern, you know. So that that part is, of course, very positive. And one of the gap gap ups was strong earnings, um, but you know, it is a, it is a small, very small cap stock. Uh, the earnings are not all that exciting. Um, you know, I, I mean, 
if you if you don't mind playing, you know, something that it hasn't really proven itself. You know, it was it was IPO to twenty three. It's never doubled in price since then. It seemed kind of slow. You know, it's stodgy. Um, you know, I remember in the nineties. You know, you, you want to be on board a stock that's proven itself by at least doubling. You know, before you get involved with it. Um, you know, that that could be you know from IPO price, of course. You know, if the IPO was twenty, it's a hot stock, and it's lists at thirty, goes up to forty. That's a double. You know, but at least it's proving itself. And th this one just is just stodgy. It's slow. Doesn't excite me. Uh, the only things going for it are the two gap ups that that are nice. I mean, someone could think, oh, well, maybe that's just the start of its move. But the earnings, I don't know, it doesn't have enough going for it to, to get me interested. Not at this juncture. I noticed there's some big funds have been coming into it in the last quarter, the last reported quarter. So that's they're, they're, uh, there's a fair bit of sponsorship. I'm showing 185 funds owning it uh, right now. So, and that's up from think, 173 you know, it, last it, quarter. It, if it makes a nice move, like if it starts to go, then you can always buy an extended, you know, the uh, continuation pocket pivot, which is nice because pocket pivots mean you don't have to buy in the base. You can wait for the stock to prove itself. Yeah. So, anyways, let's see. Hawk is Safeway spinoff that sells gift cards and e-gifts. Oh, I'm all over it, baby. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh -huh. Let's see. What what does it show? It's uh, I don't know. This one says op operates payment network in the U.S. and 20 other countries to offer gift cards and other. Okay, that's what they're doing. Okay, maybe that's exciting. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't really excite me, but it's going higher, so you can't really argue with that, you know. Okay, what else are we looking at here? Any any brilliant names? Any any hot names that are going to be the next big leaders? The you know the the real walks uh, that are out there. I don't really see anything right now that's setting up. I gave you guys these uh, last week, and we looked at uh, you know tubes. Another one on the pullback looks okay. It's hanging in there all right. Nothing spectacular, but uh, I'm noticing some of the NASDAQ data is getting funky on us. In other words, uh, getting delayed, you're getting crossed uh, bids and offers. It seems like some of it's uh, reconciled, but I know some of it's, like, like I'm noticing right now widespread on Twitter. Let's see if you guys can see this one. Here's Twitter right here, 4209 bid, 4220 offer. That seems a little odd. Um, But I don't know. Maybe that that is what's happening. Who knows? Anyways, um, no, nobody has any brilliant names for us. So you know, I don't, I don't really have anything that I'm at right now that gets me all excited. Tesla, here's a pocket pivot. But Dr. K, you don't like this, right? Yeah, you know, the problem with Tesla um, is that it's had uh, two gap downs on volume, an appreciable volume in the last couple months. So those are two big defects in the pattern. So we've got, uh, you know, um, uh, two days ago uh, enough volume for a pocket pivot, but it's a lower quality one simply because the, the price volume action leading up to it is poor. Wow. Um, it's flawed. You know, I would much, it's much better to wait for this thing to really come around, uh, base out a little longer, and then issue a pocket pivot. Then it becomes more forgiving. But right now it's too early in the pattern. Yeah, I would agree. I think, uh, the, and and the other thing is that this is all caused the the uh, Monday and uh, Tuesday move in Tesla. The breakdown, which uh, was shortable, I thought once it breaks the ten day, and I actually came in long the stock, a couple thousand shares coming in on Monday morning, and once it started to break the ten day, I just reversed and went short, and then it broke down to the twenty day or two hundred day, which I think short term is a logical spot for it to try and bounce, and then you get the gap the next day. But this was caused a sell off was caused by uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal talking about them shuttering the Fremont uh, plant and also uh, uh, having to offer all these sales incentives because their sales are are lagging, I guess. And then Ward's Auto, which is an online magazine, came in also on the same day with an article saying that their year-over-year -year sales in September were down 26%. And uh, then the next day, Elon Musk, who's become the latest tweeting CEO, which, you know, I think all this tweeting stuff is a bunch of baloney uh, from, for CEOs. But if you have a statement to make about the falsehood of the uh, numbers put out by Ward's Auto or the Wall Street Journal, then you should make a statement. But tweeting it to me seems kind of cheesy and, and uh, quasi-official. You know, if you really have something to say, then say it uh, instead of tweeting it. Uh, but in, in any case... Uh, the reality is that Ward's Auto is looking at a different set of numbers than Musk is. And so it's like, you know, what, what numbers do you want to use 
to show how great your sales are. I, I personally think they're probably going to slow down. And I, I, my view is that the action of the stock is already telling you there's a warning sign here because you basically have failed on a breakout. Okay, So all you're doing here is rallying back up to the breakout point. See that on the weekly chart here? Let's make it a little bigger. So that's all you're doing. And you've already formed this fractal head and shoulders on the breakdown. And there's a lot of selling volume. And, and I think... You've got to watch out for some of these big funds like Contra Fund, whoever has built a big position and has owned the stock since it was down in the 20s a long time ago, two, three years ago. Uh, they, I think they're starting to sell it. That's what I think because I think the, uh, the fat part of the S-curve now is slowing down and, and, once, and it's not going to pick up again until they come out with some models that, are, that address the, uh, the lower end market and can really give them a chunk of the existing auto sales that are out there. So, you know, what, do you have any take on that, Dr. K? I mean, I think the technicals are telling you that you've got problems, and uh, and all you've done so far is bounce back up to the top of the handle, which is the prior breakout point after a failed breakout. Do you have anything, yeah. uh, any thoughts uh, in terms I mean, of it's fundamentals? Just, it's, it's, well, yeah, the technicals tell it all. So, in other words, the technicals always win, always. So, I could sit here and say, you know, this is uh, first mover advantage, and they're going to go a lot higher. They're going to eventually, you know, be at a thousand because of this and this. But right now, the technicals are saying stay away from the stock. And we all know that, you know, the stocks that are still around, you know, and that did have first mover advantage, like the Amazons, Yahoo's, eBay's of the world, um, they went through tremendous corrections at times. So, you know, the technicals have to win the argument because that ultimately comes down to whether you're going to make money or not. Yeah, and don't ever get wedded to the fundamentals because that could spell that that will spell the disaster if you if you start uh, you know you, you buy we we have a saying you buy on both fundamentals and technicals in other words they both have to be in alignment if one is out of alignment then you generally don't touch the stock um, but you sell always on technicals you know that that's that would have saved people a lot of headache back in 2000, March 2000 through March two, through through March 2003, when the Nasdaq lost 75 percent of its value. So yeah, just that, that, that's kind of something that I find you know has been very helpful in keeping investors on track. You know, buy on technicals and fundamentals, sell only on technicals. Uh, Mobileye. Is, it's hanging along the 20-day uh, here. Volume is drawing up. But I still, I, I think, unless this thing starts to move before earnings come out next week, I'm not really interested in playing it. I bought some yesterday off the 10-day, uh, coming off the 10-day yesterday, so I bought some yesterday. It rallied up, got above here. Uh, but I sell into that move because I wasn't really picking up any big volume in there. It seemed a little bit cheesy. The other thing to watch out for is that... Uh, you're getting this sort of compact head and shoulders, and this could be the, you know, there, there is like an IPO type head and shoulders that tends to be narrow, but you can see it fractally as well. And you got the big break here is defining the right side of the pattern. So, you know, how this resolves, I think, is going to be dependent on the earnings. So I'm not sure if I want to buy it here. Uh, somebody says, Dr. K, you said earlier you like RWA. Then you say you didn't like Hawk because of tepid sales and earnings. You like the rev and earnings growth on RWLK. I think you kind of need to use a little common sense on this one, uh, JT, because uh, RWLK is conceptual. These guys make exoskeletons that will allow people who are paraplegics to, uh, to basically walk, stand, sit, and do things that they couldn't do otherwise. And I think that the, the concept there is what over, overwhelms the... Uh, whatever you want to say about the earnings and sales, those are going to pick up pretty sharply over the next few years as they gain uh, FDA approval for more of their products. So I think there's a huge amount of potential here, but I think conceptually it will capture people's imaginations, and that's why it's interesting. This this uh, Hawk, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. This thing's going higher, and it's got a pocket pivot there if you want to buy it. Uh, but it's tepid earnings growth, and it's just a very simple business, but it seems to be catching... Uh, investors eyes look at this thing go now we're up 206 yeah, <laughs> 205 what happened did the fed come out with the qe4 i, I was just going to say the bio yeah biotech space often doesn't have sales or earnings but right. it's a very conceptual space so you have to you know that's where okay the technicals obviously have to measure up but then that's where understanding the fundamentals and where that particular stock fits in its space comes in very handy. In the late 90s, there were stocks that had no earnings um, that were internet related, but 
there was a perception of huge potential. And so that you know, perception drives price. So even if the, there weren't any earnings, some of these stocks played for huge profits. Um, and you know, our, our WLK is kind of a similar, similar situation you know, where, where it doesn't have much of anything, but a very inter interesting concept, and as well as a, a potential uh, first mover advantage in this space. Yeah. Exoskeleton is not biotech. It's cool, yes, but not biotech. Uh, I think you're right. well. You're when I say bio, obviously, I mean, as as are you going to obviously bio, You know, medical. Right. When I say biotech, I'm using a very broad umbrella. Yeah, and of course, very you don't want to buy umbrella. it because it's only you know. I bought this thing here, and it's it's up you know thirty percent in two days. So you don't want to buy that. You want to think about whether it's biotech or medical and be nitpicky. Uh, it sounds like a freaking broker, you know. And uh, all I have to say is, if, if you're so good in the market, why are you still a broker? Anyways, uh, CUDA, with all due respect to brokers, but I was one, and when I was a broker, an old fellow at the Merrill Merrill Hill Merrill Lynch in Beverly Hills uh, told me he comes up to me and says, "Kid, if you're good at the markets, you won't stay here very long." And so I was a broker for four years before Bill O'Neill recruited me away to go run money for him. So, uh, you know, I would I would actually you know when when someone starts to nitpick like that, that tells me where their mind's at, and that tells me they're going to miss the forest for the trees. They're going to totally miss right. the picture by by saying something like that. Because also, if I want to get nit, nitpicky right back, um, Real Networks is a pioneer in bioinformatics. So if you don't know what that field is, then maybe you want to educate yourself on it. But you know the word the biotech, bioinformatics. It is a biotech, arguably, because it is a technology stock applying bioinformatics. So you know, I mean, it, and again, this is a waste of time of, of seminar time to talk about something like this. But I'm 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 talking about it because I think it's instructive to listeners to make sure they don't get bogged down in, in minutia that's not going to help them make money. Right. So anyway, so that's that. So you know, let it go. Uh, Grubhub, it's yeah, you know, it's not going anywhere. It's trying to set up. I keep thinking it's an ugly duckling sort of thing that's going to turn and go, uh, but so far, no, nothing happening. Let's see. Palo Alto Networks. Uh, t t this thing is uh, trying to, you know, it's veeing to new highs, so it makes sense that it's going to pull in. You know, you can't that that sort of move. I don't think it's sustainable and. Uh, but it comes back to the 100 level, and this thing after a failed breakout is still hanging in there. Earnings come out next week, so it's just hanging in there. You know, If you're up on it and you own it from way down below when there are plenty of buy points, uh, if you could sit through all this, uh, where you might be in, you could, you, know, you could hang out with it. Let's see. Go, go. I always love it when someone with, who who you've probably got like 90 IQ points on, Dr. K, is going to get into some nitpicky argument with you. <laughs> like me. Well, also, you know, I, uh, I, I, sometimes sometimes it's the guys who are um, over-educated, you know, the academics of the world. Um, sometimes the look. I don't want to like step on too many toes. The brokers, the brokers are all storytellers. So, they, so they're, and they're, they're you know, to be, to be a the broker. Sales guys. I mean, come on, you guys who are brokers, you know what the drill is. If you wanted to trade and focus on making your clients money, they, the management wouldn't let you. You got to sell. They want you to sell. And if you're not doing any sales, they're gonna they're gonna look at your production numbers and come into your office and say, "You're not selling. You're not prospecting. It's a sales job." So, you know, I think uh, that's the mentality. Anyways, I I've been there, been there, done that. Don't do it anymore. Thank you. Uh, Dust. Uh, this is the uh, negative. Uh, uh, gold uh, ETF. I mean, gold's getting dusted off today, so you know it's breaking down because QE is ending, and that's probably a, a wonderful thing. There are people out in the streets. In case you haven't noticed, bells are ringing in the churches around here uh, that QE is over, and I think that uh, Wayne Newton is writing a QE uh, song actually to commemorate the event. Anyways, um, somebody says, "Well said." And is that on my diatribe on brokers? Uh, let's see. Somebody asking about Tesla daily looks like crap, but isn't the weekly chart shaping up? No, what I already told you is that all it's doing is rallying into the breakout point here. So, 
I don't really see, you know, the weekly chart's telling me what's happening. I don't really see anything going on. Um, ATHM. Uh, hanging along the 10-day, you could watch for a pocket pivot. I think you had a bottom fissure right in here if you wanted to take a stab at it when the market turned. That was one. Auto home. Like I said, at home. Isn't that the same symbol that uh, the old at home had? It is. Yeah, exactly. I remember one of the guys at O'Neill had bought it and had a huge run, and he was going to tell me it was a long. He told me it was a long-term hold, and he's holding it in his IRA forever. And what happened? Didn't that thing go to like five or something? Anyways. Yeah. Gilead uh, breaking out to new highs. All the biotechs uh, have come back in V-shaped fashion. Celgene uh, moving to new highs. I'm looking at Biogen. It's up here. No volume. This seems this seems like a short to me right here. So that's on my list. Don't see anything in terms of a 620 reversal. Uh, yet today, but I'm watching this one. If it does, you know, it could come after it heavy. It, it's still what? It's 1048. You still got a couple hours left. I don't know. We'll see what happens. It seems like they got this thing, you know, it's an end of the month type of uh, jack. And we'll see what happens over the next couple of days. I'm very interested to see what happens here. Uh, you look at some other names. Look, let's look at the longs, for example. Cyber is you know, sputtering around the, uh, to me, you get this, uh, right off the opening, you get this uh, MACD stretch and then a retest on less MACD. That, to me, that seems like a sell signal intraday. Uh, if you're trying to play this for a longer term move, you know, you don't have to worry about this so much because you do have some cushion if you bought it last week when I was talking about it before it moved in the webinar last week. Uh, Alexion is also, I mean, we pointed out the pocket pivot somewhere in here on this viable gap up, and that's continuing higher. So, so you kind of, I kind of wonder if you're getting this big pile in here or if we're starting the big bubble move uh, based on all the liquidity that's out there uh, in the markets. Any other exciting questions? Anybody else want to get in a silly nitpicky argument over, let's argue over Splunk. Is, that a, is this a, like a search... Uh, a search service for businesses? Is that it? Or is it a biotech? Or is it bioinformatics? Uh, in any case, this thing's coming up through the 200 day and trying to go higher. Something to keep in mind here, though, as it rallies, earnings come out, I guess, in November sometime, uh, before the midpoint in November, I believe. Uh, that you, You've got this head and shoulders. This could be a, just a big... Uh, right shoulder complex, which in it, in and of itself could turn into a left shoulder ahead and then maybe forms a right shoulder, similar to what you saw with, um, you saw Yelp do that. You, and as it's coming up here, uh, it failed here, and you had basically, a, you know, the left shoulder, the head, and two right shoulders, but also there's a left shoulder ahead, and then this one up week forms a very narrow uh, right shoulder. So, this is very interesting to watch. So, Pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Cup with handle on Yahoo going back to January, somebody's asking. Uh, let's slap a label on it. I, I don't know. If you want to call that a cup with handle, I guess. Uh, and there's your breakout. Would you call that a cup with handle, Dr. K? Do you like this uh, breakout? This Yahoo, yeah. I mean, I, it's interesting because... Uh, um, you know, it gapped up on earnings, and it's coming out of a basing pattern. Um, and if you look at the prior run, it was pretty clean. It seemed to hold uh, or obey the 50-day to some extent. Um, so, you know, it's it's proven itself just before. Um, the earnings are pretty. I mean, the uh, the sales are pretty abysmal. Um, the earnings are looking like they're they're trying to reaccelerate. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm I'm kind of hot cold on this one. You know, as as we always say, we don't need to bless every stock. If you want to try your hand at this, yeah, it's not it's not a bad it's not a bad stock. But we're always looking for the best merchandise out there, and I'm a little bit little bit reluctant to um, to go forward with this one. It's working though. I mean, you had a viable gap up. I guess you'd call that here, and it's continuing to run. You know, kind of a weird. Yeah. Yeah. Weird uh, double bottom handle. It's funky, but uh, you know, I think you're extended here. You don't want to be buying it here. And you well, ask, I mean, if you, what's if you want to play it, wait for it to pull back to to a moving average on you know on light volume, and then you could get get into it. Um, 
but yeah, like I said, it's, it doesn't quite interest me enough. Um, but you know, it's, it's you could do a lot worse um, in this kind of market. So if you want to take a small position, you don't want to pull back. You know, by all means. Someone says NUS getting to the gap fill. So you're saying this gap here, and you're up there. That's going to be re uh, resistance on the upside, maybe. I don't know. But you're really not. You're sort of in midair here uh, in terms of thinking of this as a short, you should have been on it here actually, or somewhere in here. Uh, now it's come down quite a bit, so I'm not really sure whether this is something that you want to be uh, messing with on the short side. Tube is cruising off the 10 day, hopping and bopping, running with the market. This actually is pretty amazing to watch here. Now it's turning pushing up higher after pulling in earlier. Facebook, let's see. It's uh it's come down into the lows of the base here. I don't know if it if it's going to turn back up to the 50 day. It might do that with the market, but I just I'm just watching this uh, rally here. Taking profits in CYBR, taking profits in RWLK, tube, I don't know, this almost looks like something to take profits into on the move up to the 16 area. Earnings come out next week. And you got to buy this thing. Pulling into the 10-day, I think, is where you had to come after it uh, earlier this morning. Illumina uh, on the breakout moving higher. So if you believe this is a, a double bottom breakout, then are you within, Dr. Kelly, are you within 5% of this? Yeah, no, not quite. Just outside the range. ULTA. Yeah. Look at this going. Still going. Uh, Ulta, don't they come out with earnings soon? Mm, I'm not, I don't know. I think they reported um, less than three months ago. They reported on uh, September Yeah, you're right. You know, they, were, they report in uh, December. I mean, that's holding up okay. They had a good earnings report, so it's holding up okay. Did You, you didn't have a pocket pivot along the 10-day, so... Trying to come out, but the volume is below average, so I don't know. But it's acting okay. I don't know if I'd want to buy it now. I really don't want to buy anything today. So if I'm long some stuff that's running, I'm either looking, you know, hold, looking to sell into the move uh, as it, as they roam higher. But I'm not really looking to start jumping on stuff in here. And I think it's a little bit dangerous to be doing so. I mean, if you want to try it, go for it. But I think. Uh, I think we're, we're setting up for a pullback and you've got some uh, month-end manipulation. Is that your take, Dr. K? Does it seem manipulated, this move? It feels like it to me. I mean, it's nice <laughs> like to be said, long into, uh, but it still seems kind of weird, you know? Yeah. And, I'll, you know, the, the Dow's going to, you know, closing in on its old high of 17,350. Yeah. And, and, you know, straight up off the bottom like that, I think we'll see at least some sort of deceler, you know, we'll see a, a slowdown in this rate of ascent. We're going to have to, I mean, if history proves out, we'll we'll see some sort of pullback, but maybe the pullback's only a two-day pullback, and then, it, and then it goes to new highs. Um, but this time around, without the QE, um, the winds of QE, uh, you know, backing it, I think it's going to have a tougher time, but we'll have to see how price volume yeah. plays out again, yeah. you know, because that's, you know, what, what we think doesn't matter. What, so the market will tell us uh, what to do. Somebody says, none of my option trades have been going through due to data issues. Traders may be using stock as hedges while data issues go through. Well, yeah, okay. That sounds uh, feasible to me, you know. Uh, okay, true. These guys came out and announced their uh, earnings the other day ahead of time, pre-announced. And I guess they're beating by a couple of cents, and the stock went down yesterday. I think this happened Wednesday or What's today? Thursday? Yeah, so Tuesday after the close, I think that happened. The stock came back in. And uh, it's undercutting this low. So, you know, theoretically, it might be in, in play for a uh, undercut and rally type situation and forming a double bottom, and it's going to break out. So that's something to keep an eye on. It's kind of interesting. Um, let's see. Must have missed this one, RFMD. Yeah, RFMD is gapped up here, but it's in a V-shape. They came out with earnings, I think, yesterday. And I think they were pretty good, up 150%. But it's back to the top of this range. So there's another stock. I think they're merging with these guys, acting similarly. Triquint. Okay, any others?
I don't know. The time to short, I think, is coming. It's coming. I'm just watching my 620s here. Let's see. Let's go through my uh, my whole short list here. Just to kind of, you know. So Relap Biogen is still running, but with all the biotech stalling a little bit here. You already had a cross on the MACD, so my guess is you probably, you may see it dip in. Uh, let's see. Twitter, I thought it was cover earlier. You got a MACD stretch, and then you get the buy signal here. It's already down, you know, a long way. So now you're getting the rally, and it's holding above. You, you get a cross. You're starting to see the MACD cross. Maybe it rolls in. Sort of watching this rally, I, I think stock's going lower uh, from here. MNK, someone's asking about, uh, what is this? Mallinckrodt, public limited company. No idea, not not in a buy position for me. Let's go back to looking at some of these. Um, Solar City comes out with earnings next week, but th you know, this thing was a nice play from the... Uh, the failed cup with handle, so it had this cup with handle try to break out here, which coincides here on the daily, uh, then breaks down. That's a nice uniform drop below the 10-day. Using If you use the 10-day as your trailing stop, now it's above it, so you'd be out of there. Um, but notice how it undercut, just barely got into these lows of the cup here, and that triggered the undercut and rally. I'd say maybe the, the closing lows are probably what figured into this more. And the thing has turned, and... Uh, you know, acting acting well. Uh, let's see. But it's not in a position to be shorting. I would be watching some of these names that come out with earnings. Uh, did data come out with earnings yet, Dr. Cat? I don't think so. No, it comes out, I think, any day. Data. But again, nope. here's one of these situations. This is like Yelp, okay, and it's like Splunk. Is that in that you have this big head and shoulders, and you're coming up the right side, and you're making these ascending uh, right shoulders here. Now let's look at Yelp. You had that similar thing going on in here. So if you want to go like that, it looked like that there, which is looking good. Okay, and you see that occurring in some of these names like Splunk, and you see it occurring in Data, and you see it occurring in. Uh, did Workday come out yet? Yeah, no, same thing. And my what I'm watching here very carefully is that as these things come out with earnings, I think this, that could cause them to break down and, and then they start uh, coming down from these right shoulders and, and finishing out these heads and, and shoulders that they're making or that they seem to be forming and that all seem to be similar to Yelp. So, you know, that's something I'm sort of, you know, trying to super sleuth here uh, to some extent in terms of seeing, thinking about what might happen in, after earnings. Because we are in earnings, and of course that puts a spin on everything in terms of playing earnings roulette. Are you going to hold a position long or shorten something into earnings? I, I did actually go short Yelp into earnings because of the, my theory on this as a right shoulder peak. And that actually worked out pretty nicely. Facebook, I thought a late stage failed breakout, and I uh, actually was shorting that. I shorted that above 80 and in turnings, and I've covered that over the last, you know, yesterday actually, I think I covered it, and the uh, day before, it's come down a little more, I guess I should have held on to, but I, I don't want to be piggy, uh, and then I'm, today I'm looking at potentially shorting some LinkedIn uh, into the uh, earnings announcement this afternoon, but the, the other thing is, can lightning strike three times? You got hit on Twitter, you got hit on Facebook, does LinkedIn get hit? I'm wondering, what do you guys think? Short it into earnings or not? Let's see if anybody's awake out there. Nope, they're all asleep. I don't see any IMs coming in. Short LinkedIn and Ori, so the first vote. Short it, short it. Lock, I don't know what that means. Go for it, short it. Go for the home run. Yes, short, negative, short it, short it. Trade your own plan, that's the answer I was looking for. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, trade your own plan. So my plan might be to short some of this thing uh, into the close and... Uh, well, I'm actually short a little bit right now, but I already got shorted up here at 205 the other day. Oh, okay. It's coming in. It's not a lot. LNKD. Let's see. Hear that? Let's let's see what's going on here. QRO. Isn't that interesting? Right as we're talking about LinkedIn during the webinar, briefing.com comes out at 1402. It's 1102 my time. LinkedIn uh, third quarter 14 earnings preview. Uh, consensus call for EPS of 47 cents versus 39 the prior year on revenues of 557.7 billion plus 42 percent year over year. I don't know. Got lucky on Facebook. Got lucky on Yelp. Do I feel lucky for the third time? I don't know. I have to think about this one. So, uh, oh, lock, life lock. Somebody's asking about life lock. 
I'm, I was wondering what that was. Uh, that's a, I guess you call that a, a, a big move up, I guess, uh, coming out of here. But that's what it looks like. I don't know. I'm not going to buy it. Uh, let's see. These guys are telling you to short, but it's not their money on the line. Oh, it may not be mine either. So, I mean, I can just take my five and a half point profit there and, and go away. So, but if it blows up, you know, there's sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. If the thing blows apart, you know, if you're short a 10% position, blows apart, you're not short enough. And if it goes against you 10%, you're, you know, you've got a, a tolerable loss. So it's almost like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Uh, so I don't know. But it's worked the last couple times. Anyways, um, I think that's pretty much all we got. No hot ideas for you guys. A um, couple other things I'm looking at. CTLT, uh, you know, it's, uh, I was talking about this on the chat room the other day. It bounced off the 50-day here, trying to go to new highs. They come out with earnings next week. Trinet had a pocket pivot here, pulls back into the 10-day and reverses. Probably with all this hot upside movement in the market, you know, it's, this is just a roaring bull market. Uh, I think if you're playing new merchandise, uh, you're doing well. It's the CyberArk, you know, we gave you that one last week, so hopefully that's helping you out. Uh, Real Walk is looking good. And we'll see where this thing ends up. But my guess is we'll see in the next few days, uh, I think next two or three days, probably Monday, uh, what this rally is all about and whether the market uh, isn't getting close to at least a uh, pullback zone. You got anything else to add, Dr. K, before we sign off? No, I think it'll be interesting in the days ahead because uh, we've got no more QE. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm anticipating the uh, some inter interesting times. All right. Take care, you guys. We'll catch you next time. So long.